Okay, hey everybody. Uh, today we have uh, Irvin Ang on the channel. And so Irvin is a coach. He helps freelancers uh, in copywriting and coaching as well. And basically he's here to teach us today how to analyze and construct highly converting copy. Uh, so really a pleasure to have him here today on the channel to teach us something. <laughs> so we're going to learn something uh, today. So you guys sit back and relax. Uh, okay, so I'll just pass my time over to Irvin first. Let him introduce himself and then he can go over his content as well. Okay, Irvin, go ahead. Yeah, hi everyone. Nice to meet you. And one of the thanks, uh, especially to Jonathan for allowing me to do this presentation for his audience. So for myself, a short background about me is I actually started off as a freelance marketer. Then I had my first breakthrough as an entrepreneur in freelance copywriting for doing for other businesses. But right now, actually, I coach other copywriters on how to become a better freelancer overall uh, in the business aspect and all that. Yeah, so... I prepared this very nice uh, presentation for you guys just to really go through what is the thinking behind an uh, actual full-time copywriter so that even if you have never done copywriting before or you plan to hire a copywriter, at least you know this guy, whether he's good or bad. Lah. So I feel, yeah, that's what I have for today. This uh, masterclass, I call it, <laughs> it's another copywriting thing. <laughs> I wanted to think, how can I hook everyone in, right? Even though I know this is going to be recorded, but I, I thought it was quite funny. So basically, a lot of people, when they... Business owners, they ask me, like, how do you do good copywriting? Then people always say, obviously, you must be a very, very good writer. In fact, some people even say, oh, my English is not good. I was never a straight A student for English. But then I say, like, copywriting is actually not about having very strong language or whatever. It's really about simple, direct communication. And in fact, the title, as I, as I written down here, the best copywriters don't even spend much of their time writing. It's really more on the thinking and the research. So that is what I'm really going to cover in today's session. Yeah. So who is this mainly for? It actually appeals to almost anyone. If you have like a skill, you have a skill or offer, but then you don't really have any idea how to communicate it to your market, then this will actually help you to maybe refine your offer, help you understand your target research uh, even better for your audience. Or maybe you are doing freelancing, maybe you are already doing copywriting or you are doing graphic design and you want to find out how to find that perfect client. This might even be for you because it helps you in your research and all that. Or maybe you are like in Jonathan's case, he's doing e-commerce. There's a lot of uh, product and services that he sell. So this will definitely apply uh, when you write your Facebook ad copy, your email copy and your sales page. And yeah, even applies for any business. But uh, you're doing like cold traffic conversion and it's not working. So this might help you as well. Basically almost anybody. Uh, yeah. So today's uh, key topic, I have broken down into three sessions, like three main topics. So the first one is this thing called the magical eight-letter R word that really makes or break a piece of copy. And many, many copywriters, even the really good ones I know, they think they are really, really good and they try to overlook this as well. And as a result, the promotion from being four figures to seven figures in terms of like the revenue, right, from the ad, it really like becomes like from seven, it becomes four figures. It becomes like really, really bad just because they skip. And it's not to say like the copywriting is bad. It's because they skip this uh, process which involves the eight letter hour. Then after that, after this, uh, this section, we're going to cover into the two things I always teach all my copywriting clients. Like, I actually have like full paid clients that uh, they ask me to teach them like how do I go through my copywriting process. This is the exact same thing I teach my paid clients as well. Yeah. And after this thing, I'm going to teach you how do you learn this uh, ancient technique used by our ancestors. It's really, really interesting because copywriting goes back a lot in history and a lot of the best copywriting principles are from many, many years ago and we still apply them to this. I'm going to teach you how can you use this same uh, principle in your own uh, business to sell with a uh, better copy. And then at the end, there's a surprise segment I kept for everyone on more on like a software routine and you maybe you can teach yourself and your copywriters that you hire in the future for your business. Yeah, so let's go right into it. So as mentioned, my intro is actually, I actually failed two businesses in the past. I used to so do a drop shipping store for a bit, but it didn't go very well. It was really, really uh, interesting. First, experience into entrepreneurship, so a lot of up and ups and downs, but I think it was a good experience. Then I also did my very first uh, eSport media agency with my ex-business partner, and that didn't go so well as well because of COVID. Like we set our events, but after that, it came crashing down. Then eventually, I went to become a copywriter, and now I'm a coach as well. And I also run this uh, freelance lifestyle newsletter where every day I just share my tips. Uh, and you can also subscribe to learn how I write my copy. <laughs> yeah, that's all. So let's go right into this uh, eight-letter R word. What is this exactly? Is this uh, eight-letter R word? <laughs> Actually, it's a really, really simple thing. La. It's research. La. So as I mentioned, research, right, is really the difference between a four-figure and seven-figure promotion. Right? And this is not just said by me, right? It's actually said 
by a seven-figure copywriter where he shared some of the best tips that took him from zero to seven figures in one year. Yeah, and this guy was the ex-copy uh, chief of Mind Valley, which is a very uh, well-known personal development uh, company in Malaysia. Yeah, so how do you even do good research? So this was a standard template that I have used for a long time. And I wouldn't say I'm the guy that created it. I just took whatever I learned from other good copywriters and I basically plug it and I share with all my clients and students. And in fact, even before I start writing any copy for a client, right, or myself, I always try to ask the client, like, can you, could you help me like do this short survey first? And the reason why is because as a copywriter, right, you need to understand the power of like leverage. You need to understand that your client will definitely know more than you about his audience, his market or whatever. Even if you already like are in this niche for a long time, your client always has more information than you. So that is why you need to really uh, give them the time to answer and don't go straight into writing the copy. Like I'd rather wait for them to submit this first. So this was a real uh, actual case uh, example. Recently, I have a client who is an insurance director. Then they want me to write an ad copy for a retirement uh, plan or something. So since I actually have no experience in this particular insurance uh, retirement niche space before, I actually gave him this and this was what he filled up. La. So you can see who is your customer, very basic stuff. La. What is their interest, their pain points, results and obstacles and all that. So I took their answer and then I went through my own research process. Then I combined them together and then I looked through everything first before I start writing. So how do I do my own research process, process then, right? So actually there's many, many ways out. So I'm not sure about you, but a lot of uh, copywriters, they even tell me, even through some of the paid courses they learn, they actually have no idea how do you actually do research. They say like, is it like on a whim, you just go to some Facebook group or you just interview someone then you just try to write down whatever they say. Actually, there's a step-by-step -step process. So there's actually many, many ways. So one of the best copywriters, I think his name is uh, Perry Belcher. She actually shared in this mastermind interview on some of the best uh, copywriting routines, right? Is that every day, when he wake up, right, when he go for his morning shower at like 7 o'clock in the morning, he actually will play the TV, right, of the US news. Then he'll listen to it every day for one hour. Then he'll take out his notebook, right, then he'll just start jotting down what is something interesting that he feel can add into his copy, like, because he's based in the US. So because I have a client in the US, I also try to do that every now and then. But if you are based in Singapore, example, then you just listen to <laughs> Channel's News Asia or something. Like. Then other than new uh, US news, right, you also can go to this gold mine of... Uh, data, which is Facebook groups. So maybe let me give you a short demonstration of how I actually do it. Because Facebook groups is seriously one of the best places for research. It's, it's just go uh, as a copywriter or a marketer. Like let's say I, uh, my niche is like other coaches. Let's say I help other coaches or course creators to really scale their business. So I'll just go into this kind of groups, right? Where literally the title speaks for itself. Uh. Then I'll just go in, then I'll read. Then you can see that the good thing about Facebook groups is this. It's very hard nowadays uh, to really find uh, high quality research information where it's really not filtered, like they really don't hold back. So in Facebook groups, right, this is one of uh, such a place uh, because like you see they, they just ask like questions, then people comment, 81 answers, all of which is like things that really give you top quality information to really understand how your marketing and from there plug and pull into your research. So, so it's like you can see the person is like asking whatever, la, like 5K, how do you do an offer? Then all of this, I can just plug and play. Then I really like spend one, two, three hours going through one group. And there's many, many other groups. La. Like if I just type uh, coaches or, or, or whatever, you can see the whole uh, groups pull up. All of this, right, is a, I, I like to say it's a gold mine. Each of it is a gold mine. So if you want to find, you want to dig out all the gold, you really need to spend some time in each of the gold mines. Uh, you can spend a few hours. So for me, I actually spend a few days just digging through Facebook groups and pulling everything out. But then now you may ask me like, Irvin, so if Facebook groups is so good, but then what happens if I like cannot find enough information, which might be the case, I don't know, maybe your niche is like alpaca farms or something. Maybe there's actual niche. Then you cannot find a Facebook groups of alpaca farmers. Then you say, how do I find? So there's actually other ways. So one good way, right, is Reddit. So I'm sure you know recently the Wall Street bets and all that, then everybody like blow up. It's because of Reddit, right? They use the Reddit thread. So actually Reddit is also a very good source of data farming. Because uh, I had one client, right, who was in the home decoration niche. So what they do is they sell these canvas paintings, then the customer can just hang it up. Then it's like a picture of a horse or whatever. So Reddit is like a place where people really like, like to post pictures and all that. So I realized that, hey, actually, why not try to use the Reddit groups to find? So for example, for this one, right, home decorating ideas. 
you can see there's a lot of like people just post their pictures or whatever. Then there's a lot of comments. So from there, I also just like dig out and really like uh go through. I feel like Reddit's also like pretty good as a Facebook group. But in terms of really uh solid content, I think Facebook group is still the strongest. And let's say if Reddit still don't have good ideas or research content, right? Then there's still one more. This is a particular, particularly uh relevant for anyone who is doing e-commerce. So Amazon review is actually one of the best uh, places to really like get all the reviews uh, because people don't really know, but do you know like you can actually go down right one by one, the five star, four star, and, and all that, right? Then actually all the five star reviews is like go. Some of them they really share stories of like for example, this uh, customer, like my client is a e-commerce store in the jewelry niche. So for this one, right? When they write about, oh, I ordered this healing kit for my mother, then it's like, uh, whatever, la, like the mother like crystals and, and, and all that, then they're very happy. So I actually swiped this entire review right, and I created it into an entire like email campaign. So I saw, I, I gave it, I literally, I, I took this, then I told my client, right, that this product seems to be working really well. And since like this is like probably another dropshipping product, go and ask your supplier if you can go and source a similar product. Then we use the same concept of like, oh, maybe mother, like now, now you see like next week, Mother's Day is coming up, right? Then we use this product, I package it with the same story angle, like, oh, you know, it's a perfect gift for my mother. I, I created this product because of, of like, wanting to impress my mother or something, bring her into crystals. Then we just sell. Then actually people actually buy it. Like, in fact, another e-commerce in the same niche told me that it's impossible to sell this at $99 because that's just too high. Like they only sell like, the same product for $56. But because I wrote, I use the Amazon research, I really understand what is the core point of the customer, right? With my research. Then I just swipe, I put in the same kind of copy. I actually could sell it many, many times, even though at $100, which literally the other e-commerce sellers say is almost impossible. But like, like that is a scam and nobody will buy, but can still sell because I really understand uh, what is the trigger point of the customer. And yeah, I just connect through my uh, research. Okay, can, so that is really like, should... Uh, the importance of research uh, is like really, really hello, hello, not, I mean... not going straight into writing, not like trying to half ass this. Really, really, this this is the goal. Uh. If you really want to make sure your copy is strong, I mean, or even you like your conversion hello? rate, all that, you really need to give space in this and work together with your client. Maybe, maybe you can take it even one step further. Like, uh, I actually asked my client if they are willing to interview their customers. Yeah, can. <clears throat> so, I will actually go and uh interview the customer with my research question. Then I'll say as a thank you for your time, I will actually just ask, give like some kind of like 10% coupon because like what is, it's nothing like a 10% coupon compared to all of this uh, research, right? Trust me, like the conversion will really show it for itself uh, because your customers are your target audience. They are the one that already bought. So there's no way a copywriter can understand the customer more than the customer can understand themselves. Uh, yeah. So that is on research. So now you may ask, yeah, you may ask like, how much time do I need to really spend on research or writing? A uh, good rule of time will be 50-50. At least 50% 50 of my time, I will research. Writing, actually not so much. More time will actually be spent on trying to figure out what works, what is the big idea, and, and all that, yeah. So now is the interesting part. I really like to talk about this because either some people think they understand it, but they don't, or they really have no idea about this. Like some of them, I ask the copywriters, they say this is the first time they hear this, even they go through some other courses, they never heard about this before. So these two concepts I always teach my copywriting clients even before we go into copywriting, it's called the market awareness and market sophistication. So there's a very good book called Breakthrough Advertising, which is one of the best copywriting books ever. It's written by one of the best copywriters in the world. Uh, unfortunately, he has already passed away. It's called Eugene Swartz, and he talks a lot about this as well. Yeah. So uh, apologize, my drawing is not very good because I draw it on my computer, but mainly the five stages of market awareness, I like to call it in a pyramid so it's easier to visualize. So it goes from uh, most aware to product aware to solution aware, then problem aware and unaware. So I just assume that everybody is new to this, so it's easier to explain to everyone. But the main idea is that most aware is a customer that already bought your product before. They know your product very well. And then, uh, yeah. So after that, there's a very high quality of traffic because it's very, very hot. So it's very easy to convert. Then the next is product aware means they probably never bought your product before, but uh, they kind of know who you are. They already kind of seen your ads many, many times. And right now they are still thinking of whether to buy from you or one of your other competitors. So you're just one of their options. 
Then as you go down further and further, solution aware just means they already know they have a problem. They know that they have a solution, but they don't really know that you sell the product. Like let's say you sell uh, you sell jewelry. They know that they probably want a jewelry, but they don't know that you sell. Example. Then problem aware just means that they know they have a problem and, and all that. Lah. So as you go down the pyramid, you realize that uh, more people are actually further and further away from the awareness spectrum, meaning that most of the market is actually unaware that they don't that they don't even have a problem. Like let's say, okay, let's say I like I have a person that I know that like, they sell health supplements like for diabetes. Most people, even if they have diabetes, probably they won't wake up and say, Oh, I need to buy a health supplement today for my diabetes. Nobody would think of that. In fact, that's why I always like to say, actually, we like advertisers, right? Copywriters, they actually are doing a great uh, great thing for the world because if we don't ever market to them every day consistently, then we will never be able, then they will never be able to realize that they have this big health problem. And then because of that, their health problem may actually be very, very bad by the time they even want to fix it. Yeah. So the main idea is that before you write your copy, right? Always understand which part of the pyramid you're aiming because the copy will dram dramatically change. Right? It's very, very obvious to tell. Like one look, you can tell whether this person is writing for unaware or product aware kind of uh, audience, uh, whether it's like how cold or how hot. So most advertisers I see, right, even in like, let's say Singapore, because I'm based in Singapore, even on the very big advertisers, right, in the property niche example, they are writing to like product aware, most aware, very, very direct kind of copy, yet they're running on cold traffic. So that is probably the reason why it won't convert. So let me show you an example of what, what, what do I really uh, mean by that. Yeah. Okay. So let's say Facebook ad library, right? Uh, let's say this, uh, I don't know, I, I, I hope uh, I hope this uh, advertiser doesn't watch this video, but I don't know, I always, people always ask me to use this uh, example because uh, they are very famous, they run a lot of ads in the property niche. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, no, no offense, no offense to them, uh, no offense to them, this is just an example only, just a learning example. So you can see this advertiser, they are in property, right? And they run a lot of video ads. I, I think they have a very big budget. I even see them running on YouTube, right? But you see their ad copy, right? They are just talking about, oh, here's my product, the address of the uh, property, uh, it has high floors or whatever, whatever. Then come and check us out or book uh, uh, appointment, whatever. But can you see like how direct it is? It doesn't speak, it doesn't speak to uh, my audience. Let's say my audience, right, is problem away. Means they know that they want like they, if they want to invest, they want to invest in property, right? They need to find a property, but they don't know how. But they know they need, they need to invest. And they need to find the right kind of property. But this kind of like copy, right? It doesn't speak to them. Like when they read it, they cannot understand. Because this point, let's say this person, right? Have no idea about property investing. They don't even know what the heck is a good factor when it comes to investing in property. So when you write these kind of things, right? Immediately it turns them off. They, they, they will just click away. Yet... Like, even though you probably can convert them if you know how to write to them. Like, if it's problem aware, I'll probably write to them like, oh, three factors when it comes to finding the best property to invest. Like, first, must be good location. Second is the price must be, I don't know, like, like they say every four years, the property cycle go up and down or something, you know? So you educate them. Then from there, then you maybe can bring them to a landing page that talks more about this then. Like, one, one such property is this property at Holland Drive. Then to them, oh, now it connects. Then can you see from there, right? We can convert this portion of the market, right? All the way down, right? To, to the bottom, to the up, right? Like if we can convert problem away all the way to most aware audience with this kind of like sales process. But right now, if they continue like this, right? Probably they only can hit most aware and product aware, which is like 10% of the market, which means they are leaving 90% of the market on the table to other advertisers, which is a huge portion when you think back, like property in such a niche, right? One sale is like how much? Uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, so it's really a lot of money that's being left on the table because you don't understand market awareness. Yeah. So that's more on market awareness. So now is uh, the second thing. The second concept is different. It's a bit more different. This is a bit more like, I guess, vague to most people. It's called market sophistication and Again, in the book, Breakthrough Advertising, it really talks a lot about this, but I'm just going to summarize it so it's very easy to maybe understand it. So let's say uh, bakery, right? I always like to say, example, everybody loves bread, right? Let's say Singapore, you know, got bread talk, got four leaves and all that. So what is your what is your favorite <laughs> bread, bread brand? I don't know. 
let's say, okay, let's say bread talk, right? Let's say bread talk. So a level one market sophistication would mean that, let's say Singapore, right? Like a, like a city or a town. Then first time, right? Uh, one, one, uh, one guy come in, then he sell the very first uh, bread shop. Let's say bread talk. La. Okay, let, obviously that, that is just, this is just like an example. La. Let's say like many, many years ago, back when Singapore just started out. Then the first guy that want to do bread business, right? He set up his first shop. It's called Bread Talk. La. So at level one, right? Since you are the only uh, business in this niche, it wouldn't be very hard to sell your product and get people to come in, your customers to come in. Like probably you just put, put like flyers outside your shop or put some kind of like poster or what, right? People will start coming in because they never seen it before. They are curious to find out more. So probably my kind of copy, if I was at level one market sophistication, I'll just say, uh, come here to buy your daily loaves of bread. That's all. People will come in because there's no other competition. So I don't really have to try very hard to get people to come in through the door and buy my products. So that's just level one, very, very basic. Uh. But obviously in today's world, there's, it's very important. It's very, very hard to find a market that's level one market sophistication. Probably is yeah, it's very unlikely. So now it's level two. So now I've got two bread talk. <laughs> Maybe got bread talk, then got four leaf also. Another brand, uh, another business that sells bread. So now it's no, no longer uh, possible to just say uh, in my copy, by get your fresh loaves of bread at Bread Talk. People don't really care because the next door, my competitor is also selling bread. So how can I get the customer to come to my shop instead of the other competitors? Both of them say, buy, buy your fresh loaves of bread, right? How I can do it is I enlarge the claim that my product or service does for the customer. So I'll probably say, buy this fresh bread that not only uh, is fresh, but it's super uh, delicious, very, very uh, yummy and confirm like you will never want to eat another kind of bread again. So I enlarge the benefits or the claim that what I do, example. Then now my customer will come to my bread shop. La. So that's level two. When I have like two players in the market, la, like one competitor. Now, now there's one level even higher, la, level three. So now instead of bread talk, four leaves, there's one more bread brand that comes in, like a bread business. Let's say Baker's Inn. Wow, so many people, right? Then how, how do I get people to come to my shop now? It's, I can't just, even if I say my bread is delicious and all that, everyone can say that also. Then like people won't come to my shop. How can I differentiate myself from my competition, right? In terms of like marketing. So now we have to go one level higher, which is something that not many people know about, which is called the mechanism. Mechanism, what does it mean? It means you go from the outcome to the process. What do I mean is like, uh, in the example of like say bread talk, probably you have seen it before, like maybe not bread, but maybe it's some kind of like chocolate or, or, or food or whatever. Instead of saying that the, the bread is delicious, right? I say this bread, right? I have some kind of special recipe that is passed down from generations to generations. Like some of the restaurants in Singapore, they pride themselves. Like the reason why they are so famous because they say they have this kind of secret recipe or, or bakute or whatever, like some kind of food recipe that uh, nobody else has and it's very delicious because of this recipe from their grandmother. Then everybody come to the store because of this recipe. They want to find out what is so good about it, right? So they don't even need to say that the bakute is delicious. They are, their food or, or bread is delicious. They just focus on the mechanism, which is how did they create it, the process. So that's how you differentiate at level three market sophistication. Then this is uh, the highest level already. <laughs> so you can see now the, the town is already developed. There's cars walking by and there's traffic. Then every corner of the street, there's a bread shop because business is like that, right? When somebody sees an entrepreneur, sees another entrepreneur making so much money in this space, then naturally like people will start to come in like, because like if the barriers to entry is not that high, then everybody wants to make money also like, because it looks like there's a lot of money to be made. So how can you differentiate uh, yourself from other competitors in level four, which is really, really tough. Like? is to just, uh, again, enlarge the mechanism. So instead of enlarging the claim, now we enlarge the mechanism. So maybe I can say I have this secret family recipe, right? That's been passed off for hundreds of years. And this bread is like freaking good. I'm the only one that have it. But not only that, now I see this recipe, right? It also has some kind of like special uh, science formula by using some kind of special yeast, right? And this yeast, right, it, it comes from, uh, it comes from the Himalaya mountains. Okay, I'm making this, up, like this, this is like obviously nonsense, but you know what I mean. I basically go even deeper into how is this mechanism, like how did it come about? So I review more details about story. Maybe I can create a story. So a good example, real life example, if you're based maybe in Southeast Asia, I think you will understand it. There's this uh, very famous uh, candy brand. I think last year or this year, it blew up, you know. 
and they didn't run any advertising course. Like, I do not think I saw any radio ads or posters outside like on the MRT streets or on TV. Right? They didn't run any marketing. Yet, it blew up. Like, the product blew up. The, this candy is like, it's called, I think, Himalaya Salt Candy. It's a very delicious candy. Eh? And I tried it myself. Like, it's really good. But the interesting thing is this. This is what I shared with other copywriters as well. Is that this product, right? The reason why it blew up so well is because they understood market sophistication on a very deep level. If you flip to the back of the wrapper, right? They actually have a full paragraph that talks about how this candy was developed. Or they go to the Himalaya salt to get this uh, pink Himalaya salt. And it's a natural uh, material, some kind of like uh, chemical, right? Not chemical, like, but some kind of like natural material that hundreds of hundreds of years of erosion or, or what in the mountains, right? And, and they, what they found out is that this, this, this salt, right? This natural thing, right? It actually has uh, 108 natural properties that our bodies also have. And it's really good for our body. And it's very, very hard to get it. So because they enlarge the mechanism, right? They say, oh, you know, this, this, this candy is from like, this kind of like salt in the high up in the Himalayan mountains. We are the only one that have it. And the consumers, right? Nobody heard of it before. Of course, naturally, they get interested. And obviously, the, the, the candy must be nice. Like, not, nobody will buy, but it's good. Like. But because of that, it blew up, you know, like, before you know it, in a few months, I saw in every supermarket I go, everybody takes the Himalayan salt, they put it, the, 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 the shop owner, right? They put it at the storefront. Then everybody's buying it, you know, like, I, I see on Facebook, people start to publish, what, 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 mouth marketing, everybody start to, like, share, and it's like, oh, this, this candy is amazing. Yet, can I say that uh, the candy, the confectionery, the chocolate uh, niche, it has been around for hundreds of years. It's probably more than level four, maybe even level five. Yet, they were able to pull it off with almost no advertising because they understood this concept. So that is just a real-life example I'd like to share. Yeah. So uh, we are almost to the uh, end. This is the third concept already. Actually, <laughs> very, really, really fast. Hope you are enjoying this presentation so far. So this is... Uh, now I'd like to share more about this uh, ancient technique, right? Used by our ancestors that can help us to sell with better copy. And it's also endorsed by a very well-known marketer, the owner of Click Panos, uh, Russell Brunson. He talks a lot about this as well. <laughs> so this, this concept is actually, uh, it's called storytelling. La. Yeah, storytelling. It's not a very, very uh, hard thing to understand. So now I just like to ask you a short, uh, let, let you guess, uh, just a short uh, question. Out of these three options, right, which do you think, right, in real time, when right, they actually tested this copy head to head, uh, three different sales letters, uh, which is a very long form piece of copywriting, right, which one was the most successful? And the objective was to send this piece of sales letters to owners of uh, people who like love dogs, dog owners, dog lovers, and maybe just people who love uh, charity, that, like philanthropies. So there was a time when I came across this example, real life example in the US, I think. This marketer was asked to write a sales letter, sales letter, right? To help raise money for a dog home because the dog home had no more money and they are like non-profit and they have like tens of thousands of dogs to take care of, but they don't know how to raise money. So they asked the marketer to like just send out a request to all the rich people or people who have money to donate to the dogs, to support them so that they can continue helping these dogs. So this marketer, right, wanted to do an experiment. So he did three kinds of copy. The first one is he literally take a, a, a case study of one of the dog that was very, very sad. Like this dog, when they found him, he was almost dying already. Like one of his legs almost dropped off already, which is like insane. Then his owner just left him to die. Then they say like, if this dog rescuer, right, didn't manage to come in time to find this dog in like three days or like three days later, right, the dog would have died already. Uh. So this marketer took this story and really like just focus on the pain of the story and say like, oh, it's damn sad. And, and like really there's so many other dogs like this guy. And if you don't donate, right, something terrible is going to happen like that. All of them are going to die. So the whole copy, right, is just focused on like a very emotional story of like a dog. So that's like the first example. Then the second one, right, is they combine the story. So half of the half of the sales letter was the story. Then half of it was more on like the facts. Uh, like, uh, you know, uh, the charity really needs money because like we've been doing this for three years. Then now we need money to fix like renovate and, and, and like we need this and that. So it's like very logical stuff. Like, like why, why I need your help? Not so much on emotion, not so much on story. So it's like a half-half. Then the last one is really like just straight up. They just say, uh, can you donate? money to my charity because we, we need help and, 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 and all that. It's like, there's no story. It's just very logical, like just very blatant pitching. So guess which copy, right, converted the most? Like probably what people, people were probably think, at first I also thought that uh, it's either, it's either a uh, story or a story with facts. But the result came out and it was very interesting. The story, right, just the story alone, right, converted way higher than story and facts and, and facts, which, which means what? It probably means that because uh, uh, the writer was able to 
create the story that resonates so much with the dog owner, right? Because they can visualize, oh, the dog is suffering in pain and, and because of that, they really want to help. It triggered their core emotions, which caused them to donate the money. So that is why when people say, uh, emo- people, people buy with emotion and justify logic, right? One way you can really pull out this concept for your copywriting in the future is to really capitalize on storytelling. And Russell Brunson talks a lot about this in his book, Expert Secrets as well. Like he talks about some, some concept about this that you can also read about. Yeah. So I want to give you one example to really uh, illustrate what I really mean. This is an example of a sales letter. Not, I did not write this sales letter, but I and myself have uh, broken it down, analyzed and use it for my own sales letter as well. So this is a health product that helps people to uh, alleviate the symptoms of this uh, medical condition called tinnitus, I think. Tinnitus is like, a, it's like those people with hearing aids, right? Their, their ear has a lot of uh, problems. Like they keep hearing this sound. I don't know, like, like their ear, they cannot really hear properly and usually it's old people that get it. So how did these marketers sell it with storytelling? Let me, let me show you an example. So, yeah. So mainly like, how would anyone sell this, right? It's like, it doesn't sound very easy to sell because uh, this market is very niche and tinnitus, I, I have never even heard of it before I ever read it. I don't even know what the heck, I didn't even know there's such a, a condition exists. So it's not that easy to sell so compared to like diabetes. This is a very, very niche uh, topic as well. But this marketer was very, very smart. I, I don't know whether the story is real. I, I don't think it's real. But he was able to craft a very like captivating story that really illustrates the pain of tinnitus and how this product really saved this guy's life. So you can see like uh, this copy, right? He straight away, very fast, he talked about this uh, this person. Lah. He's a retired guy who, who was a veteran. Then he couldn't hear properly. Then straight away, they go into the story, like the action of the story. So another thing about storytelling is like, how can you write very captivating story? Right? Because people today, they have very short attention span is to really uh, go straight into the action. That's why you see some of the movies, like, even like Avengers Infinity War, right? You don't see the first scene. I, I, don't, I don't think the first scene was like, oh, now they are happy. Everything is good. It's very, very boring, like introduction. No, they straight away, they go straight to the action. Like probably like the Thanos just smash the ground. Then everybody, whoa, like the first few seconds, they really hook your attention really. So it's the, the same concept applies in storytelling. So for this one, he said like this example of a patient of tinnitus, he got beaten, robbed, and left on the roadside because of his condition. He couldn't hear. Then some gangster beat him up and leave him there. So the author is like, he said he's a, some kind of reporter. Then he found him on the roadside. Then he had to call ambulance and, and, and try to save this guy. Lah. Then after that, eventually he talked about tinnitus and, and all that. But you can see the story is very, very captivating because uh, he talks about plane crash. I, 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 don't, I really don't know how, how can you create this. It's very interesting. Lah. But he basically say that he nearly died in a plane crash because when he want to go overseas, because he's a journalist, right? Then he want to go overseas to get some news, news coverage or something. Then halfway the plane crashed or something. Then after that, because of the plane crash, right? This guy, Anthony Robbins, Anthony Romano, also got tinnitus or something. Then together with this US uh, veteran, right? Dean Warren, they have to find a way to get a cure of tinnitus. So the story is basically like, he died, he, he never died in a plane crash. He got tinnitus. Then after that, he stumbled upon uh, some forest in Alaska. <laughs> then some village lady tell her about this natural cure that was found in their product, which later they're going to sell this product that helps them cure the tinnitus. Then from there, they bring the audience to say that, oh, tinnitus is a horrible disease. It's very hard to cure. And eventually, because of this uh, natural cure that they found, they created some kind of supplement. And, and this supplement is only they have it. No one else have it. And now you have to buy it because this is like, one of the best solutions in the market. But I'm not going to go through the whole uh, sales letter because it's going to be damn long. But I just want to illustrate that uh, storytelling is a very, very uh, powerful tool that really any marketer can use if you really, really understand how is it to really like craft uh, a good story. So another example I have, right, is my own ads that I run on Facebook. And I also use the same storytelling. So it can be applied on any platform like sales letters, Facebook ad, or email. This is another example, right? So it's a very short, this is my own real life story. Like it's, not, it's not fake, like it's real. So I just talked about my past before I come into entrepreneurship, right? What was my past? Oh, I, 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 worked, I worked at this part-time job that I couldn't even like deliver the food as a waiter, right? I was a horrible waiter. I couldn't even wipe the table. I got, remember I got scolded by my manager because I didn't know how to wipe the table. Then eventually I got to a point where it's like, uh, life sucks. And, and clearly there must be another way. I can't just be working like this. This doesn't make sense to me. 
Then eventually, I discovered the entrepreneurship and blah, 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 you know? Then eventually, I tried to sell my offer. And, and this actually works very well lah, because people resonate. People may not resonate that I'm an entrepreneur, maybe now that you have all the success and all that, but people will resonate when, when you are, like, like, let's say, everybody works probably, everybody probably works at the first, first time for, like, probably work at a, some kind of, like, part-time job. Then they hate their boss. They, they hate working part-time. So that's, that's how I pull them, people who are problem aware or unaware, that eventually bring them to product aware, solution aware, and, and all, all that. Lah. So that is an example of storytelling in action. Yeah. So let me go back to the slides. Okay. Yeah. So now I'm just going to cover this uh, bonus segment where People always ask, so what are the kind of tools? Is there any tools a copywriter can use to improve their copy? So my answer is yes, and it's free. So one of the best tools I ever found, right, was this thing called the Hemingway app. So Hemingway was actually a very famous uh, copywriter back in the, don't know how many years ago, but, but he's a very famous guy. And he was famous, he was famous for being able to write copy that could sell very fast because uh, his words, right, could speak directly to his market. And what, what we found out is that the more easy it is for your audience to understand your copy, right? The easier it is for your copy to sell. It's because this is the thing. It's like a psychological thing. You can read it out. I, I think it's real. I, I think there's some studies that talk about it. But basically, our brain, right, has an emotional side and a logical side. Yeah, excuse me. An emotional side and a logical side. So how it works when our audience, right, when they read the copywriting, when they read the advertisement, right, the more... Difficult it is to understand your copy. Let's say I sell some kind of supplement. Then I keep using this kind of jargon, medical terms like, uh, uh, I don't know, like diabetes, one, two, three, four, five, six or something. Then they cannot understand it, right? Because like, it's some kind of like medical jargon. If, they're not, if they are not a doctor, they wouldn't understand. Their brain has to spend more time trying to understand what does it mean. Because they are using the logical side of the brain, right? More, right? They, have to, they, they, are, they are not able to use their emotional side of their brain more. Like they have to use more of the logical side. And because of that, it stops them in the track. They cannot continue reading your copy. And because of that, they'll never get your call to action and they'll never buy. So, so this is why it's very important to make your language as simple as possible, to really make it as though, like uh, I always like to tell uh, every other copywriters that uh, you should be writing right to an audience as though like they are six years old. Means a six-year-old child can understand your words, no matter what you sell. Even if you sell to lawyers, right? It has to be freaking under, like super easy to understand. A primary school child right, should be able to understand your copy very, very well. So you can see, for example, for, for my emotional story, right? I got a grade five. Lah. And grade five just means I think like six years old or seven years old can already understand it. Even though it's like a pretty long copy, like 300 words. And it's because like at the start, right? It wasn't very easy because I came from an academic background. I took literature and I was very used to writing flowery language. So I thought that writing flowery language was better. So a lot, a lot of my copy efforts was very bad. It couldn't convert because the audience couldn't understand me because I didn't write simple enough language because they had to use more of their logical brain to think and it stopped them in the tracks. They couldn't continue reading. So over time, I, I tried to use the Hemingway app over and over again to the point that now, right, even if I don't use the Hemingway app, if I just write it on my computer and I paste it in to double check, it should naturally already be about grade five to six. That's, that's how, how you can become better over time like, by cost, constantly... Uh, trying to think how can I write a uh, simple language, just really focusing on the emotional part of the copy to help them to convert. Yeah, so that is a Hemingway app. And one last part before we actually end the presentation is uh, another thing about routine. So another thing about what makes a very good copywriter is really routine. It's not about having the best uh, technique, the best strategy. Or it's really, at the end of the day, it's really routine because the habit, like good habit, Good habits uh, determine whether we are successful or not, right? One of the important factors, I'm sure you agree, is your habits. So what is a good routine of a good copywriter? For me, it's actually hand copying very good copies of other copywriters. So one example is this uh, copywriter. He's called Ben Settle. To me, he's one of the best email copywriters in the world. Like he runs a self-copywriting like copywriting, publishing business where he teaches people on marketing and all that. And he's like seven figures or something. And he just writes emails every day. He writes like three emails every day for like more than 10 years really. So when I started, right, I hand copied his emails every day from scratch for like 15 to 30 minutes. Like every email, I would take out a physical piece of paper and I'll write it down every day for six months straight, every single day. And what I noticed was that after six months of doing this, right, 
from scratch or without any understanding of copywriting, my thinking slowly shifted. I started to understand like, why did he write it like this? Like what goes behind in the mind of a very good copywriter? I started, my brain started to naturally just, I don't know how to explain it, but your brain just kind of understands how to write copy and it's very, very interesting and, and, and yet it's free. Like you don't, I didn't have to pay anything because he's, honestly, I was telling my other client and he also agrees that after I asked him to do the same exercise is that your, his, his free content is basically better than some of uh, other copywriters like paid content. Like literally like just hand copying his uh, emails like I show you, right? Like every day he emails like Ben Seto, like you can see. Then today I just uh, read this email and I just copy it also. Like, like you can see, little known brutally sadistic client manipulation tactics. In fact, this, this subject line that you study, right? Can I say you can also use it for Facebook ads, the headline, you can use your sales letters. You can literally swipe it into other things. Like it's just very, very amazing. Like, like how Ben Seto can take this uh, simple concept and just plug it into any, anything really. So that's really one of, uh, I would say one of the very uh, good habits that you can do every day to become a very good copywriter is to really, really just like follow closely to another, I like just follow, clo following closely to another uh, very good copywriter that you know, and just uh, always like hand copying, studying their copy every day, just trying to understand their thinking. So you eventually become as good as them. I guess the first question that I have to ask, right? Just now, can yeah. you share your screen, uh, go to the slide about uh, Amazon reviews and Facebook groups, right? Can I ask when you're actually doing the research on that, what are you actually looking for? Like what uh, material and what insights are you trying to gain uh, when you're trying to research that, that pieces? Yeah. Oh, that's a very good question. Yeah. So mainly what I'm trying to look for, right, is uh, like I said, the, the template, right? Trying to figure out how can I plug and play into the template. So mainly is uh, probably like, yeah, pain points. Mm -hmm. What is the outcome that they want? But more importantly, this is uh, maybe for Amazon is better, is uh, emotional stories. Like sometimes the customer, right, they really, they don't hold back. Like when they give a review, right, they really just say everything, like why they buy it, what is the reason and, and everything they share, like what they're satisfied about with the product, what they are not satisfied. But maybe I'm trying to dig into the core reasons, like what is the pain point or outcome. So for example, I say this customer, they ordered the product for the mother. So before I even read about this uh, article, I probably wouldn't think of a frame of a gift. I probably would think like these people, like they buy the, the jewelry, right? like the crystal jewelry is for themselves. Like they will, I don't think they'll buy for their mother. But in fact, as I started to test this more and more, I realized that actually people would actually love to use this as a gift. Because this uh, niche, for this niche, right? These people, they are very, very spiritual. Like they believe that the stones, right? And all that, right? They have healing properties and it can help them a lot. But the thing is that a lot of their own family, right? They don't really believe in it. So they want to at least try to spread these uh, healing properties of the crystal, try to share with their family and, and, and give to their friends because like all of them, they also have some kind of problem in their life, but they refuse to believe and all that. So they are trying to find a way to, to give them. So only through this kind of research and insight, then I realized like, oh, now I have to like tailor my copy in a sense that it's more of like saying like, why this should be a great gift for Christmas, their birthday, what are some of the angles that you can, in fact, use to encourage your friend? Like even give them suggestions of how you can encourage your friends to try out crystals. Like I can write a whole article about that. It's try trying to really okay. go deep into the thinking. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, because angles. this is a very specific story and mm. specific uh, analogy to this person alone, right? Like how, how relevant is that if you apply that to mass market? Because if, for example, you're putting the copy on ads, you're going to like 100,000 people. Right, this particular story, like how do you know that this resonates? Or are you trying to spot patterns or something? Correct, yeah, that's a very good question. So basically, I am trying to spot patterns. So I'll really look through over and over again, like uh, Amazon, then I'll try to cross-reference with Facebook groups. So let's say for this niche, I am so in the Facebook group like this. Then I also realized that in the Facebook groups, they also talk a lot about uh, gift gifting the crystal to their friend. Mm. They, like for example, this one straight away six hours ago. Mm. My friend lives with the husband, whatever. So they are, this, I realized that this, this niche, right, is they really like, they care a lot about others, people around them. They mm. want them to be happy and all that also. But I didn't realize that because I as a person, I wouldn't say I'm like that also. So it wasn't natural for me to think like that. But only through enough research, I realized that this is something that they, is a strong value of them, like empathy, caring, concern about people around them, just loving people. So now okay. I have to tailor my copy 
to that sense. Yeah, it's about spotting the patterns. Yeah, right. Yeah, because how I know, right? Maybe this is just unique for this person. How I yeah. know is for mass market. Yeah. So it again, it's about research, spending yeah. enough time. Yeah, thinking on the go. Can I ask you, why why is it that like you go to the your PowerPoint slide about the copywriting template, right? The framework, right? Yeah, the discussion template. Like, why is it that more businesses, right, don't do this? Like when you consult a client, for example, like why <laughs> why is this not common sense? Uh honestly, I have no idea, but I would say it's because maybe the first they never hired a copywriter before. And okay. secondly, is their understanding of marketing is a, a bit different, or maybe they just uh just try to like I, I, what I want example I heard from another business owner is I'll just take a look at what my competitors are doing then I'll just swipe them and throw in my product and, and just try to test everything that works I'll just keep swiping or something which won't okay. work well because yeah, 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 you're already doing something that's already tested yeah okay. I mean I have no idea but okay. even if they know yeah, even if they know right a lot of times the research that they have is too surface level it, it doesn't really impact the copy you cannot feel it so yeah, yeah. it's another thing also the depth okay Understood. Okay, so my, my next question is, um, you mentioned Property Lim Brothers, right? And then they sell in the property mm. niche. And then they are very dominant, you say, like big players in the Singapore market, for example, yes. high real estate property. Uh, besides their big budget, if their copy sucks, right? Why why are they still like uh, doing so well, if that's the question? Yeah, so uh, I would say that they are, I really have no idea how well they're doing, but I see seen, I seen them running so long means it probably must be good. I would say it's because... Uh, Maybe their Facebook might not be that good, but their YouTube is crushing it because they are really, really good at uh, shooting videos. I, I see some of their views, very, very high quality. They, they know how to present and all that. So maybe because they, they are, their expertise is in videography. They have a very talented videographer. They know how to communicate and pitch very well. That's why they can crush it. But I, I would say in terms of like the copy, maybe Facebook is really like, I don't know. It just doesn't sound very good uh, in, in, in the example based on what I shared, like the awareness, just okay. an example, yeah. Understood. So you also mentioned the Himalaya stone thing, right? The, um, oh, yeah, the Himalaya and stuff. But like, for example, if you're just selling a random brand, right? And then you've, there's no personal brand attached to that brand. So how, how do people think about, how do entrepreneurs think about um, how do we sell true story, if that's the case? Oh, yeah, that's a interesting question. So a lot of times, actually, even like, Many brands I work with, they don't really have a very strong brand, like unless you're like Nike or Apple, right? But you can still sell very well because uh, story is storytelling is just really about trying to express your own experience in your customer's shoes. So maybe let's say a lot of times, like a founder of a company, the reason why they created this is because they was a customer themselves. Like I probably like if I like the Nike story, right? Nike story is that they they themselves are athletes, they like the shoe, but they always find that the shoe could have been better. So they created it themselves. So mm. a story in that case would be just going through your experience. Why did I create this brand? And using the emotion saying that previously I was a customer and it was very painful for me. I couldn't find this uh, solution. There's another brand also, I think. I don't know what it's called. Blush Boss is some very famous uh, cosmetic brand. The lady was was uh, had a skin condition and all the market, like all the cosmetic products she tried to use, uh, Sephora or what, didn't work. So she literally just created her own product then sell the product through her story storytelling mm. skills and, and it blew up like I, I think I think it got sold for a lot of money la. so that's an example just really going through your own experience and using the power of storytelling to express it to the market and even without any brand people will feel it because they understand they are in their shoes no? if your targeting is strong they understand it so even without the brand the emotion speaks for itself then they will just buy oh. yeah okay understood uh, a bit personal question about you right you say you mentioned esports media agency Oh yeah. Like, why 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 did that why uh, did that work out? Why I, okay. I would think esports so, is popping, right? Yes. So uh honestly the first re- reason is because me and my back then me and my uh, business partner, we are not business people, we are gamers. So our thinking was that if we both like game, then we know that esports is trending, right? Maybe we are one of the first players in the market, we can somehow make this work. So okay. we so this is a business mistake, very important business mistake that I learned, I really learned a lot, is that Never ever, like product also, never ever create something first. Always first, you must survey the demand. Make sure there is a demand. There's already people wanting to buy or a lot of like hype coming into your business. Then you create the thing. So for us, the mistake, rookie mistake was we created the thing first. Then we tried to figure out how to bring people to our website. Like we were creating content for months, eh, like on our website, publishing the esports content, daily news. <laughs> Nobody was watching. <laughs> okay. But in fact, if we flip it around, I'm sure we will, it will have been much better. Lah. But 
we actually hosted a competition also in COVID when COVID just came. So it was damn hard also. Like, cause we were like kind of like half events company, half media agency. Yeah, a lot of uh, rookie mistakes, but uh, yeah. Okay. Ups and downs. So how, how did that transition? How did how did you find copy then? Oh, the, that, that's, that's the thing about copywriting, man. Literally, copywriting itself hooked me in. So I saw one day I was scrolling on Facebook. <laughs> I was scrolling on Facebook. Then I saw this ad posted by uh, 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 Sean Ferris, which is uh, one of my copywriting coach. Then basically, I was reading his, his copy. Then I was like, wow, this, this text is uh, it's very interesting. Like, the way he writes, it's like as though I really resonate with what he's saying and, and it's just different. Like, I've never seen this kind of writing before. So I went to try to fi- find out more about what is copywriting. Then from there, I just got hooked. And when I've made my first uh, sale, or I realized that this writing actually can help someone. Because mm. back then, I, I never imagined like you could be a writer. La. Like I always had the pre notion that being a writer is impossible. You have to be either like J.K. Rowling, you must know how to write Harry Potter or, or you could only be an English teacher. But I never thought there was another world of writing because I, I always realized I love writing. So from there, I just go down the rabbit hole and then all the way in already. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You say, you say you made your first sale. So what was that? How did that? Um, you, oh, yeah, I guess yeah. you learned that you applied, right? So what was that? Yeah. yeah. So I, I learned copywriting for a few months like from free content, blogs, and, and, and the course. Mm. Then I just used my copy to pitch to other business owners that I could use copywriting to help them with their ads. Yeah. So I used that. Then eventually, I connected with my first client, which is the jewelry store owner, the e-commerce guy. Then he asked me to write a piece of copy for him for free, lah, which I'm okay with because I don't even know how good I am. So yeah. eventually, the first one sucked, it bombed. But the second one did so well, they're able to scale the product to like 15k a month or something. Mm-hmm. Then ever since then, it just he gave me a yeah. shot, then he paid me, then yeah, correct. Okay. Then from there, it just, <laughs> yeah, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Understood. So as in, how, how does, um, what's it called? Your, I remember you said you hand-wrote hand wrote your notes and copy for many days. That is like oh yeah, yeah. really hardcore. So respect to you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> but, you. <laughs> but, like, when when, when yeah. you're doing that, right, what was the, what, what did you learn? Because you said you eventually get good. So I, I understand that part because I've done it myself. I, I didn't write uh-huh. hand, handwritten, la, but uh-huh. <laughs> I understand what you mean. But for, for other people, right, what, what did you learn after going through that process? And yeah. Uh, yeah, I learned many things. The first thing is I learned how a good copywriter thinks, right? It's so different because in the writing, when they, the way they write it, sometimes, cause especially for like the one I learned, Ben Settle, his copywriting content is literally teaching people how to think and write better copy. Like he, he educates like copywriters. So, so mm-hmm. from there, I learned his thinking, how he writes and the way he like pitch. Like he always will use some kind of like headline that always like ho- hooks your attention, different angles. Then I realized that his content is always, he'll give a story first, then transition into a lesson and then a mm-hmm. pitch, which always like, I realized that's like a flow. Lah. And I realized that it's like very, very uh, powerful. So I learned his thinking, I learned his techniques just by writing, but naturally is there's this there's this thing that like they say, like there's a reason why uh by by handwriting the the words uh it actually helps you to memorize, helps your brain to memorize uh information faster. That's that's mm-hmm. a that's a study they conducted compared to if you just type it on the computer, right? It's very hard to register. Yeah, yeah, that's there's, there's, there's a study like that. Also. So I realized that that was another reason why I, I guess the hand copying really helped me a lot like, early, earlier earlier uh, in my early days. Okay. It's still helping so me just, today. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just more like uh getting used to the muscle memory. Uh. Is that what you're saying? Muscle memory, uh thinking, yeah. It's just like it's a very natural transition. Oh, because uh I don't know, one of the best advice I gotten, right, from a very good copywriter was that copywriting is like to be very, very good, right? It's about consistency, it's about habits. Mm. So one of these, one of uh one one of our way to really instill this strong habit in me is to just do, do this or this. I, this is what I realized. Naturally, it will just help me become a better writer. I realized. Yeah. Okay. Understood. I know there are some tools now that is like they they use AI and then you just... I don't <laughs> yeah, know if you've seen a, that. I've I seen that before. Very big debate on this. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, so what, what, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah. So basically, <laughs> there was a very big copywriting Facebook group and I actually just asked for fun. Then it blew up. Like there was like 100 over comments. Even the moderator was talking about it. Yeah. But the main consensus I realized is that... uh. There's really no right or wrong. I would say that in 10 years to five, 10 years time, right, copywriters are still needed. But the AI will reach to a point where it becomes so good, right? That if you are not good yourself, uh, you have to be of a certain standard. If you're not there, right, actually there's no point hiring a copywriter. The AI will actually write better. But if you are good enough that like you really understand storytelling, emotional copy to a very strong level, 
then AI can't beat you because AI is AI. Yeah. It's, like, it's not a human, human. But I foresee the, the, the trend is that everyone uh, says is that eventually the copywriter right, will need to work together with the AI. Mm. Means it cannot be, it has to combine together. Then from there, the copy will be like even stronger. Like it probably like it reduces the time. It, it takes less time to write out because AI will like, just press one button, right? AI will create everything for you. Maybe like the template or whatever. Yeah. So it's very efficient. Yeah. That's like, I, I guess the trend for AI. Understood. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Understood. I also know that because I, I, I work copywriters, right? So um, they oh, always yeah. say they have like writing block. How, how does one overcome that? <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure you... Block. I also yeah. have a lot of writing block. So, uh, I mean, there's many uh, ways to go about writing blog, but I will say the, the main idea of overcoming a writing blog is just like procrastination. How do I overcome procrastination is to just uh, start writing something. It doesn't have to be good. It doesn't have to be like fantastic or whatever, but just start writing something. Maybe force yourself to say, okay, now I have a sales letter, right? Like few thousand word essay, like a sales letter. How do I write when I have the blog? I don't know what to write. So instead of saying I have to write the sales letter today, just say, today, right, I just need to write three uh, headlines. Yeah. I just need to write three headlines. Then okay. you will realize, this is what they say, uh, you will realize that when you just focus on that, when you realize that it's much easier to write just the headline, but when you build out the momentum where you can write the headline, right, you won't stop really. Like naturally, you go on for a few hours, right, you can continue to keep writing. Then the headline block, uh, the writer's block just uh, vanishes. So basically, instead of saying, I need to write a lot of things, just say, I just need to write one small thing for the day, then I'm done. Okay. To trick your brain, uh, that actually there's not a lot of work to be done. Then it just grows. Yeah. Okay. That's how you can overcome a hit writer's block. Understood. So I mean uh I guess coming to end, last question also. Um oh, yeah, I yeah. know that there is uh now this VSL, video sales letter, right? That's all copy and it's like driven, drives a lot of conversion yes. nowadays. And then they accompany that by a long form sales letter, for example. Right. So uh when I talk to people or clients when it's like um, they don't believe that people would read such long form copy. What, what do you have to say to that? Do you have any data to back that up? Uh, I, I know it works. So, but I just want to hear your opinion. Yeah. That is a, yeah, that is a huge question. I, I also get all the time. Then yesterday I was listening to another copywriter podcast as well. So the answer for that is really, uh, it's true. Nowadays, people's attention span is getting shorter. It is no longer as easy to convert with long form sales letter. That's why you have the video. But to be honest, uh, I would say the real answer, like just like marketing, right? it's just to really test everything. Like I would test a VSL, short VSL, then transition to the sales letter. Then I would mm. test a full VSL. Then really see what works. Because ultimately, you won't really know. Like we can say like uh, probably VSL, nobody. I mean the sales letter, nobody will read, right? But actually there's a brand, I don't know, like the, the, the podcast, this guy was sharing that there's this brand called Pots and Pens or, or whatever, some kind of like Amazon brand, right? They literally scaled from like nothing to all the way to the point where they got their company got acquired by a big company, right? Mainly through long form uh, sales letters as well. Like they realize people actually read also. So mm. really, yeah, I would I would say don't we let's not have these assumptions. So like I'll try to really test everything and see see first from the data, then from there, yeah. From there, see okay. how it goes. Okay, great. Can so yeah. right, thank you so much for your time. Uh so how yeah. do people find you? Uh where? Uh, t- tell us, but yeah, how, how do we contact you? How do we work with you? In what capacity? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can connect me through Facebook right now. <laughs> I'll, I'll drop my, maybe my profile link and you can also subscribe to my newsletter <laughs> that okay. I'm really putting a lot of time now to just share the tips and all that. Then feel free to connect uh, with me on there. Yeah. Okay. Ken, thank you guys, everyone, for your time. Uh, thank that's you, pretty yeah, much thank it. You as well. Thank you, Irvin, as well. And I'll put all his links uh, down in the description as well. Okay. Ken, thank you, Irvin, for your time. Thank you, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Awesome.